Number four, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only four. We only need four more people to sign up for the Patreon for us to hit our next major milestone for $6 a month which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Katoctin Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, private members content only, and of course, our monthly giveaways. Again, we are so close to hitting this next major milestone. If you would like more information, check the link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And today we have a really special guest. We're going to be doing like another like biopic here, talking about a really cool guy, a really cool fisherman, uh, Kirk Shaw. He has a really cool story that we want to tell going from not fishing a lot to, you know, being on one of the bigger tours out there. Sir, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, Thomas. Thanks for having me on here. Now, I mean, I think just to get get right into it, because we had we had a great conversation before we even hit the record button, and I want to get back back to that at some point. But how, like, what is your backstory? How did you get to Virginia? Um, well, I was born and raised in Minnesota, and um, I was, you know, just a small little farm town in southern Minnesota, really nothing going on. I just knew that there was something more I wanted to do. Uh, so at that, op- you know, at that time in my life, there wasn't a lot of options for college or anything like that. So I decided to join the military. And uh, so I joined the Navy. I spent four years in the Navy um, during the first Gulf War and uh, stationed down in Norfolk. Uh, so then I ended up, you know, just staying in Virginia after my service time expired and uh, moved up here to northern Virginia and um, started a business and raised some kids and uh, just made it my home. What was that like? Uh, you, you did mention that you got to actually be on an aircraft carrier, and I was lucky enough to see some of the old ca- aircraft carriers down in the Charleston area, but not like some of the newer ones. That's got to – how impressive are those ships? They're almost undescribable. And, you know, my first ship was a was an amphibious assault ship. We we launched Marines and, and boats and tanks and put them on the beach. Um, so it was a much smaller ship. It was um, – but then when I got to a carrier, uh, you're, you're just in awe of how big it is. And, you know, it's like an entire city. You know, there's 5,000 crew members on there, not including, you know, the Marines. So there's there's places of that ship that I'd never even been to before. I mean, it's wow. just it, it really is a city, flo- a, a floating city. For how, sure. how many where, where can you say that you actually got to go uh, traveling the world? Um, well, like I said, uh, it, in 1990 is when I joined in August of 1990. And uh, that's when the, the Gulf or Desert Shield was was happening. Um, so as soon as I was in boot camp, finishing up boot camp, that's when it switched over to full blown Desert Storm. Uh, my wow. ship that I was stationed on, assigned to, was already over in the Persian Gulf. And, uh, you know, being from Southern Minnesota, I had never even been on an airplane before. I'd never done anything. I'd never been anywhere before. And uh, so I jumped on a plane right from Chicago, Great Lakes boot camp, and I flew all the way halfway around the world and um, got helicoptered on to my ship that was out in the Persian Gulf. And That's cool. um, so that was, uh, you know, being a small town kid from the Midwest, you know, one day and the next day I'm, I'm floating around out in the Gulf of Oman with, you know, go, getting ready to go to war. So it was uh, it was really eye opening and uh tremendous experience. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was really something I, I, I don't regret it one bit. Is, is there anything in the Navy being out there that gets you prepared for running a boat? And it, it sounds so funny because we're dealing with 20 foot dinghies compared to something <laughs> right, that can yeah. tow a tank, but sure. sure. It, is there anything in that, that, that you took for how you run rough water? Um, not necessarily rough water. Um, just because the ships are so solid. I, you know, you, you barely even feel them rocking. 
uh, especially the carrier. My smaller ship, we after the Persian Gulf, we had to go do some uh, rough water uh, qualifications for my captain up in hmm. the North Atlantic, and that was that was terrible. We couldn't even you couldn't even stay in your bunk. You're just you know rocking all over the place, and that's uh, that was rough, real rough. But um, you know, as far as the boat itself, you learn a lot about the ships, you know, and, and the terminology and port and aft and, you know, stern and starboard. And you learn all the terminology, you learn your knots, uh, you know, for tying up uh, your navigation, you know, all your buoys, you know, a lot of that stuff really translates over. Uh, so, you know, in Virginia, you know, you have to have a, a boater's license in order to operate a boat. Um, so, you know, going through that test, a lot of that stuff I had, I had already known. Uh, of course, you can't fast forward through the test. You got to do it the right way. And they, they keep you from doing that. But, you know, there was a lot of translation from from the Navy into just owning a boat. And, uh, you know, a lot of its terminology, navigation, stuff like that, reading maps. So that helped. That is actually a good one you mentioned there. Um, I, I just recorded an episode with an individual in North Carolina. We talked about just old school map study and how that's kind of lost. Like, is that something, and, and we'll eventually get to the, your your whole tournament career so, so far, sure, but sure. Is, is map study still a thing in 2024 or is it all digital? It's mostly digital. Um, digital has become the norm just because it's so much easier and they can take so much more information and put that into a digital format uh, versus on a paper map. Um, I do, however, every tournament I go to, every lake, when I find out I'm going to a lake, I order a paper map. And um, there's something to be said for me, I just having something in my hand that I can look at and refer to. Uh, there's some things on paper maps where um, it's just you can see the whole map and you can lay out your game plan, you know, where you want to go. You can easily look at, you know, the North wind or South wind, how it lays up for points, um, you know, ditches, drains. You can, you, I get a better understanding when I can look at it all in one frame instead of, you know, zooming out on a map or, you know, on my graph or, or have to sit in my boat to be able to look at a map. You know, it's nice to be able to, you know, just sit in a hotel or an Airbnb and, break out my paper map and do some paper study, paper map study. And, um, you know, I reference that a lot with Google Earth. Um, of course, you know, you can get so much information from Google Earth as far as prep work. Uh, you can see those points, how shallow they are, if they hook when they come out. Um, you know, you can zoom in and see some rock piles if the water is relatively clear. You can see a lot of that information on Google Earth. So, I cross-reference a lot of the Google Earth information with my paper maps. And then once I get to my boat, um, you know, I, 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 I can pull up my maps and, and have a better understanding of, of what my idea of what I'm going to do is. That's interesting how you mix like old with new technology there. Um, yeah, I think it's important. It, it is because there are some skills that you just need because we, we will be talking about the technology craze and stuff. And you have to have that balance of still like I still triangulate, even though I have every piece of technology imaginable <laughs> on the front of my boat. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's able to blend them all together, I do think makes you a well-rounded angler. And speaking of angling, now that we're there in our timeline, you know, you get back from the military. Uh, I believe, you know, you said you started like a, a fiber optic telecommunication business. W where does fishing fit into this story? Um, well, you know, I, I got my start, you know, I got out of the military in 94 and I had just, I worked for a landscape company, just doing some landscaping. I ended up having an unfortunate softball accident and I got hit in the head in the face with a softball and it messed me up and I was out of work. I couldn't really work. And one of my clients was actually a, um, he owned a telecommunications company. And I hadn't been mowing his, his grass at the office. So he, he contacted me and, you know, asked what was going on. I told him I had an accident and um, he said, well, you're too smart to be doing that anyway. Why don't you just come work for me? So that's how I got my start in telecommunications, hmm. like in 95. Um, and then I, I worked for several different companies. And then in 2005, I decided to start my own. And, um, you know, and I, since 2005 to this day, I, I still have it going. And, um, you know, raising kids, starting a business, you know, it just uh, it takes up all your time. You know, and when, when I had a chance, I could get out and fish. Um, I've always loved fishing, grew up fishing. I don't even remember the first time I ever went fishing. It's just always something that I've done. Um, 
you know, and then um, once the business became sort of self-sufficient, I, I just needed something to do with my time. And, um, you know, I enjoyed fishing. So I wanted to try to, you know, maybe take my hand and you know, give it a shot at, at, at tournament fishing. And that was about, I think it was three years ago, like around COVID was when you got into tournament fishing, right? Was, was there a moment in time where you're like, okay, I want to actually, you got addicted to the drug and you want to give this a go? Yeah, it was, um, you know, the, the thing that really set it up for me is, you know, sitting around, work was kind of slow. So I'm sitting around, I'm watching Prices Right on a Tuesday one day. And, uh, you know, just something hit me that, you know, you got to do something with your life. You can't just sit around and just wait for something to happen. And, um, you know, I had always I grew up watching tournament fishing and, you know, all the old fishing shows. Um, and I, I wanted to give it a shot. So I sort of looked into how to do that. And uh, I, I had saw through Major League Fishing that they had a, uh, a Marshall program. So that Marshall program, what they do is, you know, you get to go on the boat with a pro and you record their weights for them. And, you know, you just sort of uh, somebody in the boat, make sure they're following the rules, uh, you know. So I signed up to do that. And, you know, I, I had the fortunate draws to, you know, I was with Wesley Strader and, and Matt Becker and Joey Cifuentes wow. and, uh, you know, a lot of these big names now that, you know, they're either on the Bass Pro Tour or they're fishing the Elite Series. So. Um, you know, just to learn about how the tournaments are ran because I had never even fished a club tournament before. I, you know, no BFLs. I was never a co-angler. So, you know, being a marshal was as close as I could get to even, you know, being like a co-angler, uh, which was, that was very difficult because, you know, we're not allowed to fish. We're just, we're just in the boat as a marshal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of these lakes that they went to like Okeechobee where they're fishing grass mats, you know, I just, I wanted to just, you know, give me a weight to pitch around in the grass. I don't even, you know, don't even give me a hook. I just, you know, it just looks so good. And, and, you know, to love fishing that much and to have to just sit in somebody else's boat and watch them fish, it was very challenging. But, um, you know, I did learn a lot. I learned a lot about how the tournaments are ran. I uh, learned a lot about different boats. You know, all of them have different boats and different setups and, you know, um, different techniques. Uh, you know, it really you know, at the end of it, I really thought to myself, you know, these guys really aren't doing a whole lot of stuff different than I do. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think I can, I think I can at least give it a good run. So that was in 2021. And, uh, Damn. so 2022, uh, I decided that, you know what, I'm just going to try it. So I didn't want to start at the BFL level and, and, um, you know, the Phoenix league and, uh, and why, you know, be a co-angler, you know, there was just something, you know, I'm almost 52 years old and I was like, you know, if I take this route and, and you know, a lot of these young kids coming up, they, that's the route they take or, or guys just trying to get into fishing. And, you know, they may be in it for, you know, 10, 15 years before they ever become a boater. Um, and, uh, I don't know. That's just not, that's just not who I am. I, I, I was like, I'm, I'm going all in or I'm not going to do it at all. So I jumped into a nine tournament full schedule Toyota series as a boater. <sighs> My very first tournament out was at o Lake Okeechobee. That's and, insane. Uh, so yeah, that was, uh, it was, it was eye opening and, and having co-anglers was, you know, I would tell them my story and they're like, well, there's no way I would ever be able to do that. I just, I wouldn't have the confidence to, you know, be a boater and, and expect to, you know, get somebody on fish and, you know, try to pattern fish in such a short time. Most of these guys have, you know, they've been fishing it for, you know, 10, 15 years and they've been to these places a half a dozen times. They know all their waypoints. And, uh, but you know, it, I, I enjoyed the challenge. I loved it. I loved getting out there on a new body of water. I'd never been to any of these places before. And, uh, you know, I just go fishing and just pray for the best. What was that first tournament like? I mean, you, you were at Okeechobee as a marshal and now you, you, you pushed your chips in, you're there, you're doing the thing, but now you got to find them. Now you got to practice. Like what was going through your head? Um, originally when I, when I went down there, when I knew, when I saw that that was going to be the first tournament on the schedule, I thought, okay, well, I've been there cause I was a marshal there the year before, um, Skeet Reese won it that, that year. Um, and I was in some boats that were near Skeet Reese. I saw where he was fishing. So, and 
you know, just the other places that my, my boaters had taken me, I was like, okay, well, I, I can remember this place. And, you know, so I thought, well, I got, a, I got, you know, I got an advantage here because I was just here last year with a bunch of pros and, you know, I, I know where to fish. Well, unfortunately the fish weren't at any of those places. And in fact, the first day uh, I was down at South Bay, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Okeechobee, but South Bay is at the South end of the lake and uh, it, it's known to have some good fish. Um, but I wasn't catching anything and I ended up running out of oil. I, I didn't really even think about checking my oil. You know, this is all the stuff that you learn is all mm. because of all the mistakes that happen. Um, so I ended up running out of oil and um, I luckily I had a jug of oil in my boat, but the camera boat came up and said, hey, we want to take some pictures. And I was like, please, please don't take a picture of me as a rookie. First tournament ever bent over my motor trying to put oil and, and fix this. So uh, they're like, oh, we won't. We'll just stick around and wait till we'll make sure you're good to go. I was like, OK. And uh, it was funny because they asked me, they said, hey, where is everybody? We haven't seen anybody else down here. Oh, shit. And I'm like, uh, that's a Florida. That's course. a great question. Obviously, I am not doing something right because I am the only <laughs> one down here. And uh, it was it, it. I caught a one pound, eight ounce fish the entire tournament. On day one, I caught a fish that weighed one pound, eight ounces. And um, on day two, I zeroed. So mm. right off the bat, it was uh, it was a very humbling experience right off the bat. But, you know, always look in hindsight, which I always do. Um, I was on stage, you know, uh, the year before I was a marshal. Before that, I'd never even stepped foot in a tournament. And here I am on one of the biggest stages in fishing and uh, weighing in my one pound, eight ounce fish. And I had a smile from ear to ear. So. You, you start that first one and you, and you get the first time blues out of the way, but, but you had nine tournaments all over God's earth. Like when did you feel like if ever that first year you started to get like a little bit of a groove with yourself? Um, it really wasn't. The first year, I, I never really even felt a groove. It was more of uh, controlled chaos, mm -hmm. um, you know. So I had boat issues. You know, I just bought a used boat just so I could tournament fish. I never even owned a bass boat until that year, and uh, I bought it. I think in December, and my first tournament was the end of January. So I hadn't even had a chance to even get familiar with it, and. Uh, you know, so I started having boat issues, trailer issues, truck issues. Uh, so the rest of the year, um, I, in fact, I had to drop out of a tournament because at Lake Chickamauga, which I think was our second tournament that year, uh, I, I got on a pattern of fish right away. And I was like, well, this is going to be great because I already have a pattern going. I'm not even going to fish the, the last day of practice because, you know, I'm good to go. I'm dialed in. And uh, that first morning, I had about a 40 minute run. I pulled up to the first spot. I had a limit. My co angler had a limit, and I was getting ready to. So, this is like nine o'clock in the morning. So, I'm like, okay, well, let's get to the other side because I got a bunch of other good spots. And uh, going over there, my compressor blew up on my motor mm. completely down. Nothing I could do. I was sitting out in the middle of Lake Chickamauga, completely broken down with a, a limit of fish. And I didn't know anybody. I didn't have. You know, like I said, it was my like second tournament. I didn't know other anglers. I couldn't call anybody and say, hey, man, can I put my fish into your boat and uh, take me to weigh in? You know, I didn't know any of that stuff. So uh, I ended up calling Boat US and they came out and towed me all the way back to the ramp. And, you know, by then weigh in was over. Uh, so I had to drop out of that, that the second day of that tournament. Um you know, very dejecting. I just, I just wanted, I just drove back to Virginia and, uh, I, I couldn't get my boat fixed before the next tournament, which was down the Harris chain. So I had to withdraw out of that tournament. So, you know, it was really a, it was really a moment where I was like, are you, do you really want to do this? You know? And, uh, I just, I stuck with it and got my boat fixed and finished off the season um, had some good good events up north, you know, in New York at uh, St. Lawrence River, Lake Champlain, um, and we were here on the Potomac River. Um, and that really, you know, ending that season with catching a bunch of big smallmouth, 
I love big smallmouth. Uh, that's my favorite. And St. Lawrence River is the greatest fishery on the planet in my eye. Uh, so, you know, that, that was enough uh, to finish that year with catching a bunch of big smallmouth and, um, and doing fairly well uh, to keep me coming back. So uh, I decided to, to enter it again the second year and do another complete full nine, nine tournament season on the East Coast here. So um, that's that, which obviously was a much better season for me because uh, I qualified to go to Tackle Warehouse Invitationals this year. But, um, you know, what were the parameters for that for people that don't know? Um, they take it, it's all on a point system. Uh, you know, obviously first place gets a, you know, 250 points and then second place, you know, on down the line. And, uh, they just, it's on a point system. And if you can do just fairly well and stay consistently well, uh, you can really work yourself up in points. And, uh, so each division has three tournaments and, if you fish more than one division, you get put into a wild card division. So if you fish more than three, so you can fish all three Southern division tournaments and then one in the Northern division, and then that puts you into a wild card division. And uh, that's what I ended up qualifying through hmm. was the wild card division. Um, you know, I, I, I had a lot of uh, decent tournaments. I made some, um, you know, cut some checks and was able to make some cuts and, uh, you know, I, I really worked my way all the way up that wild card division. And I think I ended up in fifth place in the wild card division. And wow. uh, they'll take the top top 25 in each division, go to the Toyo Series Championship, which was on Table Rock that year. And um, and then the top 10 go, they qualify for, you know, the Tackle Warehouse Invitationals. Was that a goal of yours to qualify for the Tackle Warehouse Invitationals? A happy accident, so to speak. Um, well, it, it, I would say it was kind of a happy accident. Um, I just, I didn't expect it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was expecting to, you know, be in this for the long haul, you know, and, you know, enter some BFLs and do a bunch of local stuff with the BFLs in, in the Phoenix League and then, you know, fish some Toyotas and, and just hopefully – you know, at least become a better angler, you know, and always learn and uh, learn these different lakes. And, uh, you know, as I just kept watching it throughout the year, I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm moving up. I was, you know, 87th place and then I was 60th place and then I was 40th place and then 20th place. I was like, you know, I'm actually doing something here. And uh, so it kind of came as a shock, uh, you know, when it all came down to it. And, and I was, I was in a position where, you know, I can move up and, you know, and then I was, you know, I'm going to be fishing a series where I got my very start in as a marshal, you know, two years prior. So uh, and then, you know, getting that confidence is really key um, at. So at Lake Chickamauga, you know, the prior year, my boat broke down. So I just wanted some redemption. So we were back at Chickamauga last year. And um, I also I had boat issues again. My alternator went out on my mm. my motor. This was during practice, and uh, so I had to get an alternator shipped from Florida all the way up to Lake Chickamauga and get that put in. And my Airbnb driveway and wrenching <laughs> on it, and I, I I basically had one day of practice down there. And I was like, well, here we go again. You know, it's always something. And um, I went out that day that practice day and I caught two good fish in one area and decided that's where I was going to start. And, uh, I pulled up there that morning and I had 24 pounds and four ounces in a matter of minutes. Mm. I was six twelve, a six, nine, a five, five, fourteen. I mean, it was, it was just incredible. And I actually led that tournament on day one. So, uh, I knew I belonged there and, uh, it was just a, just a matter of keeping confident, keeping your head up, learning from all the the bad times you have or the bad, you know, all, everybody that fishes knows some days it's just, it's always something. You can't tie a, a, a knot the right way or, you know, your line gets wrapped around your rod tip or, you know, you're laying your rods on the deck, they get tangled up. And I mean, it, you, you have all those little tiny events that can really drive you crazy. And, um, you know, it's, it's getting past all of those and, 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 and knowing that you're there for a reason and, you know, settling down and getting into the groove and trusting in your, your abilities and, and what your thought processes are and, and being, you know, like I said, just 
having the confidence to, to know that you belong there. I've always thought it was a fun thought experiment to be if, if resources and time weren't an issue, do you go that route of grassroots BFLs, the Toyotas, the tackle warehouse, and, and you work up the chain or do you do what you were like Carl Jacobson did who came over here and right. he just went straight into the opens and, and which is a better route. And you know, it, it's hard, I think mentally, cause you think you should do grassroots, but it's so much different than let's say baseball where it's double A, triple A, cause the game is still the same. It's just the, the level of, of, of competition is different. But when you're going from a single day event against guys that have been fishing Kerr Reservoir, Trent, we know who you are, um, <laughs> their whole lives, yeah. like you can't, in theory, it's almost impossible to beat that. But then when you go to a three day event, a four day event, I feel like it does level the playing field out just a little bit. And could, could you speak to that at all or what your thoughts are on that? Well, as far as the, the grassroots route, um, if, if I was to recommend anyone that wanted to get into, you know, professional fishing, tournament fishing, um, do the grassroots route. If you have the time to do it, uh, and the resources to do it, it's definitely the way to go because, you know, what happens, you know, like in the Toyota series, you, you end up getting put in the boat with two, two pros on your, on those two days. And if you make the cut, you can fish that third day. But, you know, when you're out there you know, with these boaters, you know, you're learning a lot about all of these different lakes and a lot of techniques, a lot of spots, you know, you, you're not allowed to take your phone out and mark waypoints, but, you know, if you're on a, on a, on a lake and your, your boater takes you to a, you know, a boat dock or a duck blind. I mean, you're going to remember that you don't have to put a waypoint on yeah. it. You're just going to remember that. So, um, doing it that way, I think is very beneficial because you can do that all over the country. And if you do that two or three, two or three years, you know, even as a co-angler, uh, the amount of information that you're going to gain from that is vital. And it's something that, you know, as a boater, you're, you're not going to be able to get that because you're, you're doing it on your own. So, you know, being in the boat with, with several different, you know, boaters or pros, uh, you're gaining the knowledge from both of those people and, and learning, you know, different techniques and what they're using and what will work. Uh, and like I said, location, location, location. I mean, a lot of these places, you know, even the community holes, you might not even, you know, when I show up to a lake, I don't I have no idea. I've never been there before. I don't know where a community hole is. Yeah. You know, I just drive around and see somebody fishing. I was like, okay, that must be a community hole. There's five boats there, but I don't know any of that going into it. But, you know, as a co-angler, you, you learn these things mm. quick. Um, so then at, when you do become a boater, you are familiar with a lot of these places because we do fish a lot of the same, same lakes, uh, every yes. year. Uh, and you know, you have to do that. These guys have to be able to accommodate, you know, 400 people or, you know, 250 boats plus camera crews and, and everything else. So there's only a certain number of lakes in the country that can accommodate that. So, um, it, it, it is interesting and you hit the nail on the head there, something that you said earlier about you don't have the encyclopedia of waypoints and time on a lot of these lakes. And so you approach it very new. And this is a fun conversation we have on this show so much about it's hard to run like Brian Thrift if you don't have 400 waypoints to hit so many spots. <laughs> right. But yeah. you look at these Japanese anglers who there's like three fish in their whole country and their mindset is just so different of like, I'm just going to fish an area and I can figure out five. Like, what is your yeah. style this first year really on the tour? I mean, I think your first tournament, if I'm not mistaken, was on Sam Rayburn, right? It was on Sam Rayburn. Yep. Um, so obviously the prep work that goes involved with it, I, I order a map and um, I do some map study, do some Google Earth study, and I watch some YouTube videos on past tournaments. Um, and then once I get to the lake, uh, it's really by feel. Um, you know, I, I'm not confident enough you know, with having a used boat, I know this sounds crazy, but you know, I, I don't want to run an hour or two hours to a spot. So what I would typically do is I would look at my map. I would run a half hour South, a half hour North or East or West, however the lake is laid out and, um, and just kind of work my way back. And, um, 
that's that's really how I started breaking these places down is just running one way, work my way back, run another way, work my way back, you know, check the water temperature, water clarity, see what it's doing. Uh, and then, you know, pulling into a pocket or, a, you know, a creek arm, um, you know, and then breaking it down even further. So, you know, you got the whole lake and then you break it down, you break it down, you break it down. And then pretty soon you're in a, you know, a single creek breaking down that creek. So it's knowing how to break a big lake down into smaller portions. And you can't, it, it can get overwhelming when you get to some of these places because they're huge. They're huge. They're absolutely huge. And you just, you have nowhere, no idea where to even start. So um, I think it's, it's really important to, to, you know, really focus in on an area and break that area down. And, you know, having some experience in just fishing in general uh, really helps with that because, you know, you may take a small trolling motor only lake here in Virginia that may be, you know, six, 600 acres, 800 acres, and you can break that down relatively quickly. Well, you know, do the same thing when you get to a large lake, you know, take about 800 acres of that lake and break that down. And uh, that, that, that can really give you the confidence to, to move to different other areas of that lake and, and find the same thing. But it's, it's really finding something first to, you know, get that first bite and give you some confidence. What type of boat are you running right now? I run a Triton. I've got a 20 foot Triton with a, you know, 225 Merc on it, uh, Pro XS. And uh, I actually love the boat. I mean, it's an older boat, it's a 2006. But that was the year they uh, they designed those boats. I think on the the old FLW circuit when they used to give out boats to you know to the to the anglers, so everything was an even playing field. That was the boat that they they were giving them was that 2006 Triton, uh, and it, it's a they only made it one year, hmm. uh, so it's a it's a it's a good haul on it, and it rides really well, and uh, I, I actually love it honestly. What do you got decked out on it uh, when it comes to the whole technologies? Oh gosh, I have everything. <laughs> I'm running. Uh, I run Helix and Garmin. Um, so you know, up front, I have a 15 inch Helix for my 360. Um, that's dedicated yeah. just for my 360. Um, I have a, a 10 inch Helix for mapping, and then I have a 12 inch Garmin for my live scope. All that's up front. And then at the console, I have two Helix, one for mapping and one, you know, my 12 inch for, you know, scouting my side imaging and, and everything else to, to locate areas and, and structure. So yeah, it's decked out. <laughs> it's decked out. So with that said, you know, Rayburn that time of year, it, it usually, uh, well, ah, as the stats have shown us from both tours and all the tours that have gone there, it did really well. Like ah, what were yeah. your thoughts going into that tournament? Um, I just, again, I was having some boat issues before that yeah. tournament. And, uh, so I, the first day I got down there, I spent my first day of practice because we only get three days of practice. And that's a big change from the Toyota series because the Toyota series, there is no limit. I mean, mm -hmm. I could go up to a lake and fish there for two weeks every day, uh, right up to the day before the tournament. Um, but, you know, here on the invitationals, you know, the lake is off limits for 30 days prior and then we get three days to practice. So uh, for me, that three days, that's been the biggest that's been the hardest hurdle for me this year is only having that three days because, you know, so Sam Rayburn, um, I, when I get to Sam Rayburn, I had just had all my carpet replaced updated my graphs, added a new trolling motor. And literally at midnight, the night before I had to leave to drive to Rayburn, I was still working on it. Mm. And uh, so I just threw all my parts and pieces in, drove to Rayburn, 19 hours. That was tough. But uh, so the first, you know, first half day of, of my practice there spent programming my you know, trolling motor, programming my, you know, power poles, oh, dang, getting dude. my graphs to t talk to each other again. And uh, you know, cause I put in a new ethernet switch for my, for my helix so they could talk to each other in the one boat network. Um, but then, you know, to actually go out and fish Rayburn was, a you know, I had never been there before. So I just kind of drove around and, and, and look for stuff that I thought would hold fish. Uh, and I started catching fish. I actually lost a 10 pounder the second day of practice, right side of the boat. And I was like, okay, well they're here. I'm catching a lot of little fish, but the big ones are here. Um, 
so that tournament was crazy because there was a lot of little fish pulled up shallow, a lot of little fish. I mean, it was, you you were catching 50 fish a day, uh, but it was trying to get them over, you know, the limit to keep them. Um, but yeah, there was the guys that were catching the big ones. I don't know what they were doing. I mean, I, I watched the tournament afterwards, but, uh, you know, those places like that, I'd love to go back there with some time and actually really break that place apart. Uh, but you know, that's you uh, know, mentally, it, if you bomb, bomb is not the right word. If you don't do well, in oh, Florida, you, can, you can say it. No, because like if you do, if you if you okay, if you bomb in Florida, it's one thing because that place is all or nothing. It's if you yeah, find yeah. that one bigger one. When you do Texas and like Marshall drops a thirty eight pound bag, which is I can't fathom that. It's like an aircraft carrier. It's a hell of a bag. Yeah, yeah. It, and I get the whole boat, and that's stressful there. But how do you recover when you're going into this next event? Because to me, that's what's like. You have these moments, whether it's in your season during an event, that you are your worst enemy, and you can make or break yourself. Yeah, it's, um, and a lot of people do, they really struggle with that and they really get down on themselves and, you know, it can be a very negative mindset going into the next tournament. I'm just not built that way. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Marshall. He was my neighbor, uh, when we were at, um, uh, at, uh, at, what was that? West Point Lake in Georgia. He was staying really? in the, the house next to me. So I really got to talk to him and uh, he's a great, great kid, but um, as far as the mindset, you know, for me, I never, I don't put a lot of expectations on myself. And honestly, my goal every tournament is just don't be last. That's it. It's a very easy goal to, to achieve. So, uh, you know, going into, you know, after a, a terrible tournament like that, I look back on it, all the things that I did. Did I do anything wrong? Did I make any mistakes? Um, or is it just I'm not familiar with the lake and didn't know where to go? Uh, so I try to look at all the positives of it. Like, okay, well, I've been to Rayburn before and I know that I can mm -hmm. do this. And there's an area over here I should have stayed at a little bit longer or, you know, a lot of the times, you know, like I said, with only three days of practice, you know, it, it's tough to break a lake down and then, then dial in a pattern yeah. and then dial in a color or a certain technique to that pattern. You know, do they like it? Twitch, twitch, pause, twitch, pause. Uh, you know, what color is it? Green pumpkin. Do you need a little, all those little nuances that you have time to really break down at, at, at a different circuit, um, really helps. But, you know, here we got three days to figure everything out. You better figure out how to get back to the ramp, figure out all the different temperatures of the lakes, north, south, east, west, break down your technique, break down your color. You get, you got three days to figure all of that out. And that's where, having you know the experience of these guys that have been there 10 12 15 years Agreed. they have you know they don't need to spend their three days learning how to get back to the ramp they already know i don't so you know uh and that's a pro and con i've always thought that's a, another fun debate for for another show is like when, <laughs> sure. when, you, when, when you have lake hartwell on the schedule for the 98th time in a row for the bass masters or the James yeah. River for the opens, like clearly that helps the veteran because he just, you know, generically what the fish are doing at Hartwell in April since you've been there 38 eight years in a row. Since. Exactly, exactly. And I 100% agree with you there. Um, and, and you're going from a month later, you have West Point and you can't pre fish it. So what do you do yeah. between, you know, Sam Rayburn and West Point to get right? Um, you know, obviously reflecting back on your prior tournaments uh, and, and nobody had, I had talked to several people at Rayburn and nobody really even heard of West Point before. It was, it's fairly new. And I don't think they had, I think it had been 17 years since they had a tournament on there on West Steve Point. Steve Kennedy, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, West Point was just, uh, you know, it was just an unknown and, you know, I, I kind of thrive on that. I love that. I love going to a place I've never been to before. Um, you know, I just, I was excited to just get down there and figure it out like all these other places. Uh, you know, obviously I wanted to do well. I always want to do well. I always, you know, fish hard and fish to my strengths. And, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but, you know, getting down to West Point, it was, it was, it was tough because it was so low that year, this year. Uh, it was like seven foot low and it was really difficult 
the weather was unpredictable. That first day, I mean, it was blowing and freezing cold. It was probably one of the most miserable days I've ever had on the water in my life was day one at West Point. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the guys out there can agree with me on that one. It was not a fun day to be out there. Um, and, and it's crazy when you look at that. Um, and cause guys, I have like, I pulled up the stats right here just to give you an idea. Let's go down to like 15th place, you know, 13 pounds, 14 pounds, 10 pounds. It, it wasn't going to be a, a big blowout kind of event. No. And mentally, you know, the weather sucks in practice. Does that, stress you out or make you feel better? Like, Hey, this is going to suck this weekend. So everyone's got a puncher's chance. Is that your vibe? Like, what is that vibe? Yeah. My, the big thing there is, you know, you said with the, with the weights, they were so tight and uh, it's really because it was a spot fishery and you know, the spots down there, they don't get huge. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of largemouth in that lake. So, you know, the, the guys that really did well, uh, they found some largemouth. I fished there, for whatever, you know, the three days of practice and I never caught a single largemouth. And, you know, I, I found some spots, but they were, you know, they're relatively small. Uh, like I said, you get 10 pounds, 12 pounds, 13 pounds, and you're, you know, you're right in the mix, but you needed a largemouth. And I just, I couldn't find any largemouth. I, I just tried and tried and tried. And, you know, I was like, well, you know, at least I have my limit of spots. So that's better than, you know, a lot of people that aren't even catching anything. Um, yeah. So it's always looking at the positives for me. I, I, I don't focus so much on the negative. It's it's always trying to stay positive and, and know that, you know, what I'm doing is working. I'm catching fish. I'm just not catching the size. So uh, but, you know, it, it the West Point was one of those tough ones. And a lot of people really had struggled at West Point. <laughs> what's funny is uh so tyler stewart he was uh he won west point and uh, i was his marshal on lake okeechobee that year oh cool uh, so, so we you know we know each other and uh it, it was funny because the marina that he was fishing in the marina that he won in was the marina right outside of my cabin so i really I launched at that marina every day and i fished those same docks that he did every day and i just i never caught any fish on them so when I saw the footage of him fishing in there, I was like, I fish those docks every day and I had not, didn't even get a bite in there, but he made it happen. So that's kind of a crazy story. What do you think he did differently? Like, and I'm, I'm thinking more of like, yeah, now in hindsight, you could have asked him, but like when you <laughs> yeah. were going through the process though, it's like, and you turn on the TV and it's like, son of a bitch. D did you really think to yourself like what you missed that he didn't? Um, yeah, that happens on every tournament. <laughs> especially, especially the first day at weigh-in, I'm at the weigh-in bag and, you know, I'm sitting there waiting and these guys up there weighing in 20 pounds. I was like, what are they doing? And they're, they're holding up small mouth. And I'm like, I didn't even know there was small mouth in this lake. And they're holding up 20 pound bags of small mouth. I was like, wow, okay. Well, I had no idea. And, uh, I'll, that was a, that was a, a, another tournament like that where, um, I figured with the water being drawn down because it was so low that those bass were going to really, you know, pull out into the drains and on the off the long points and and, and just kind of hunker down and be near the bottom or suspend a little bit. Uh, so I was throwing a Carolina rig a lot uh, and, and catching a ton of fish on it um, or I was throwing a, a rattle trap. Um, but what he was doing, you know, he was fishing those boat docks, those floating boat docks. And, you know, he was they were right underneath the floats hmm. and um, you know, he, he wouldn't, I was fishing more on the bottom or suspended up off the bottom and he was fishing up, you know, up on the top of the water column. And that's really something I never even did all week. So you go from, you know, big old Rayburn, you go to more of a spot lake and then the next two on the schedule are really more of like, I guess you, I guess they're both the TVA system with you Fala and then good old Kentucky those are a yeah. completely different cat um yeah with their current shtick and and how they operate what was your comfort level going to them was this your first time do you have some history um kentucky lake well yeah so kentucky lake was before you follow um so kentucky lake i had never been to before um there again you know it was just uh i'm just gonna go there and wing it and see what happens you know i'll i'll I see if i can try to figure something out and that's a place that I didn't, I didn't realize the, the smallmouth fishery that it was. I just had no idea. 
Um, I, I ended up catching one smallmouth during practice in, in the back of a pocket. And I was like, huh, there's smallmouth in here. You know, but I just I really had no idea that 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 kind of fishery. Um, but Kentucky Lake, I really I like the way that place lays out. It's it's almost like three different lakes. You know, hmm. you can get on one side of the bank and it's completely different. You got shallow water, grass, wood. And if you go on the other side of the lake or the river, basically, you know, you got deep water, rock. Uh, so it sort of sets up with however you kind of want to fish it. And then you can get out in the middle of it. And, you know, you got shallow bars, like a typical TVA system. You got, you know, shallow bars and that you can that you can work. It was, it was kind of windy. And again, the weather was kind of bad, but. Uh, the, you know, it was, it was right around the spawn and, the, you know, a lot of people were saying the spawn was over. So I was like, well, you know, I went shallow one day and I saw fish up on beds. I was like, it's not over. Of course, you don't want to share all that information, but so I, I, I'd really decided that I was going to, I was going to really stay shallow. And when I say shallow, I had to prop my trolling motor up. I couldn't even put it all the way down. I had it lifted wow. all the way up and then I pulled up the rope and I actually had a hammer for changing my prop out if I ever need to. And I wedged that under there. So, I mean, I was dragging the bottom of my boat sometimes, uh, but I, you know, I was catching fish and I, I caught some decent fish and uh, I lost a nine pounder on day two, which would have cut me a check, had me in 30th place. Uh, it was sitting on a bed and uh, I caught the buck bass that was there. The buck bass was three and a half pounds. Mm. And I came back and, and she, she had pulled back up onto that bed and I flipped in there with a rage bug and uh, she had bit it second cast and came right up the side of the boat. She opened her mouth and I saw that she was just skin hooked on the roof of her mouth. And uh, I knew I was in trouble <laughs> and she shook a couple more times and it just popped out and you know, it was just like slow motion. I could just see it pop out and you know, that, that really hurt me, but you know, what do you do? There's nothing you can do about that, but uh, so that was one of those tournaments I was saying, I, you know, I just didn't realize the, the, the smallmouth fishery that it was. And, you know, these guys in front of me, you know, Dakota Ebear and all those guys were in front of me and they're, you know, holding up 20 pound bags of smallmouth. I was like, God, wow, I, I had no idea. I just, I just didn't have any idea, but, you know, Kentucky Lake, I, I was satisfied with what I did at Kentucky Lake. Cause I think, you know, I just, I've had some missed opportunities, yeah. but. I think I figured out what I, what I needed to do there. You could do either one, but um, obviously the smallmouth fishery became more of a predominant pattern than, you know, fishing for largemouth shallow. Um, it, it's so hard without a network and, and it's not, and I think people mistake when you say network or anyone that says network, it's like, it's not like you, they give you the stump. They at least narrow down the lake for you. It's like, well, this part of the lake is on at least. And that's like <laughs> yeah, a huge yeah. breadcrumb. Yeah. And you know, so having that network, you know, you see, you know, all the guys that have the social, all the big names, you know, Lot Defoe and Andy Montgomery and all, you know, all those guys, they all travel together and the wheelers and, you know, they all have that little network. And, you know, you don't necessarily, like you said, you don't, you're not giving out your waypoints, but you're saying, hey, I'm catching them, you know, on the south end on, yeah. you know, spinnerbait and 10 foot of water or, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm dragging, I'm scoping here. You're catching small mouth. Bays. Yeah. Or I'm catching this big small mouth. You know, you might want to switch over and try that. Uh, you know, and that's another thing with being so new to this is, you know, I, of course I've met a few guys and I, I travel and stay with a couple guys now that I had met down at Rayburn. Um, you know, but it, the, it's just such a small network and we try to work together as much as possible, but we're, you know, we don't know each other, you know, we just met, you know, a couple months ago. Uh, you know, so, but having that network is vital. And I think the longer you stay in it and do yeah. this, the, you know, the more doors that open for you, the, the more information you can get. But um, so then, you know, as you going into Eufaula, back to what we were saying, I had had experience on Eufaula last year because that was on our Toyota series schedule last year. Um, but it was in a weird time of year. They were they were drawing May. Eufaula down. And I don't know if you talked to anybody that fished Eufaula last year at the Toyota series, but there was one hundred and ninety six zeros at that tournament. There was one hundred and ninety six people that zeroed at, at Eufaula last year. Uh, I was there for eight days and, you know, for practice, I think I caught four keepers in eight days Wow! and I was really not looking forward to it. And, uh, that's interesting to me. It's like, um, the COVID year and the schedule got all flip flopped and you would go to these places in the fall and it 
threw a wrench in a lot of people's fishing. And it's just, it's fascinating when you see these mythical lakes that, you know, you have all these weights, but when it's, the timing is not right, it can punish even the greatest professional yeah. angler. 100%. And there was uh, you know, I was staying with a bunch of guys that day. We had a, that, that tournament, we had a big house and nobody was doing anything. You know, I, so it's, it's hard to get down on yourself when you know that the lake itself is terrible. It's just not yeah, fishing well. True. Um, but you know, so I just swore I would never fish there again. I was like, I never come back to this lake. Why is everybody <laughs> talking about all this greatest lake ever, Lake Eufaula? And we couldn't even catch a fish in it. I mean, it was terrible. Uh, but when I saw that on the schedule for this year, I was like, oh, here we go. Back to Eufaula. I was like, well, I guess it's a challenge now. I'm going to try to redeem myself a little bit. Um, you know, so I, I went and practiced in areas that I didn't fish uh, last year. Uh, it was sort of kind of the same weird weird time frame. The water was up, but what was happening at Eufaula this year was it was the spawn was just getting over with. And, you know, the bigger females, they had, they had started pulling out, but they weren't necessarily set up when their suburb pattern yet. And the buck bass even that were shallow garden fry, they had, they had pulled away from the fry. So you couldn't catch fry garters and it was tough to catch, you know, a big, a big fish. Um, and so a lot of these guys that did well, what they were doing is, you know, they're sitting on a brush pile and waiting for a fish to come to them. They weren't, they weren't spot hopping and trying to find something and make something happen. They just, they'd get to a brush pile and be like, okay, well, I know it's a good brush pile. A fish eventually is going to pull into it. And they would literally sit on a brush pile and make the same cast over and over and over mm. again for hours. Um, that's not what I was doing. <laughs> uh I was fishing grass. I just, I made a bad decision on day two, but, um, you know, I was, I, I, I caught some, some decent fish there and, um, you know, I just, it almost becomes personal when you have uh, two events like that on, on Eufaula and you just, it's, you can't break it down. You just can't really quite figure it out. And it, it really becomes personal. So now I almost want to go back there again, just to fun fish for a week and, and, uh, you know, just learn a little bit more about it. That's what it's all about. Well, luckily you, you get a little bit of revenge on your schedule now because you get to go up north with Champlain. And yeah. have you ever oh. been to the Detroit River before? Never been to the Detroit River. Um, I have been to Lake Erie, uh, not tournament fishing. I just went up there smallmouth fishing one time and just hammered giants. But, uh, you know, I'd never been to the Detroit River. Uh, I'm sure it's going to you know, lay out like a lot of these northern smallmouth fisheries do. Um, you know, it's going to be a scoping tournament most likely, um, uh, you know, cause that, yeah, that one's in the end of July. So, you know, that, that spawn is going to be well over by then. Uh, so it's, I'm sure it's just going to be getting out on that big water. Hopefully we have some good weather and we can get out on that big water and, um, and really look around and, and try to find those big schools of fish and, and hopefully get into them. So, uh, but yeah, Champlain, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, you know, I do have some history on Champlain. Um, I missed, I think I missed the, I missed a check last year by 10 ounces or something like that. So, um, but I, and I had made another stupid mistake. You know, uh, I, I spent too much time last year doing something I never even should have been doing because day one, I was just wrecking them on beds. And, uh, you know, day two, I was like, oh, I'm going to try something different. I don't know why I would ever do that, but I did. And, uh, it didn't work out so well. So I went back to bed fishing and, and had my limit in like 18 pounds in a matter of an hour. And I was mm. like, why weren't you just doing this all day? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm looking forward to that one. The one downside of that is I had a graph go bad on me down at a West point. One of my helix went bad. I don't know. There's some power issue with it hmm. that had all my waypoints for, oh. for Champlain. I lost all of them because I couldn't repair my unit. So they had to send me a new unit. And, uh, but that had all my Champlain waypoints, all my beds, all my, my sand dire. flats, everything. So there again, my first three days, my three days of practice are just going to be going back to all the areas. I know that whole big fish and just remarking, uh, waypoints on it. But, and, you know, I'm confident with that place. Uh, I just, I'm just looking forward to a place where you can go actually go catch fish all day, <laughs> honestly. So yeah, there, there are places like that where you go and it's just like, it's fun versus there's other terms. It's like, I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. From, you know, West Point to Champlain. I mean, it's a huge difference. And, you know, so, 
like I said, St. Lawrence is probably one of my favorite fisheries. Well, it is by far my favorite fishery that I've ever been to. So after Champlain, I think I'm just going to take a week off and just head over to St. Lawrence and, and stay over there for a week and just, you know, really wear my thumbs out and, uh, catch some, catch some big smallmouth. Love it. That is, yeah, that is an amazing place. What, what yeah. is your, what's your history as, as now basically a Virginia boy, like what's your history on the old title stuff? Because in Virginia, Maryland, we get kind of a reputation as, as title sticks. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, I don't, I never really fished it a whole lot. If I went fun fishing, you know, I never had the boat for it. So, um, you know, ever since I got my boat, you know, the Toyota series was on the Potomac. So I, you know, I started really fishing there and, uh, you know, I went cat fishing there with a couple of buddies of mine several times throughout the past years. And, um, you know, and I knew that you know, everything was tidally based. You had to wait for the tide to move because if it's slack tide, you're not going to catch anything. And, uh, you, you sort of get that mindset, um, about, you know, you got to have this tide, you got to have that tide. And it is important. I think it's, it, it really is important in certain areas that you're fishing. Um, but then again, you know, with the right technique, I think you can, you can still catch fish, even if the tide's not moving, but, um, these, the tide fisheries, you know, the James, the Rappahannock, yeah. you know, the Potomac river, um, learning that stuff, I think it's just a great tool to know how to look up your tides, how to, how to travel with the tide. So, you know, you can be up in DC on an outgoing tide, fish a good area and you can, you know, jump and, you know, give her wide open and head all the way down to, you know, Occoquan or Aquia Creek and still catch that outgoing tide. So a lot of the, the you know, a lot of these good fishing fishermen, they can follow these tides and, and stay in that outgoing or incoming tide. Um, as long as you have enough water to run it. It is interesting because, like, I've always found that fascinating when we talk about how the the fisheries kind of make you and and how people in Alabama do get spoiled when you can sit there. And I remember having college <laughs> yeah. tournaments uh, when we travel down south and and we'd be in the way in with other colleges like Clemson or or, or some people from Alabama. They're like, well, you know, I live five minutes from Eufaula and five minutes from Gunnersville. It's like, well, how far is it for you? It's like. <laughs> I live in Loudoun County. It takes me four hours to get to Smith, five hours to get to Kerr. Like, and they're like, yeah. holy crap, that's insane. It's like, yeah, that's that's normal for us up here. Um, it, it's a different breed of angler in our little area. Yeah, I think it is. And, you know, there's what I've noticed is even like Indiana, there's a lot of anglers from Indiana. Um, you know, hmm. in these really tough fisheries, I think it makes you it, it, I, th I think it gives you the the skills to become a better angler because you have to work so much harder Agreed. to to pattern a fish or to figure out what they're doing. Um, you know, and you know, being in Virginia, let's face it, there's not a lot of places to fish. Uh, there's not. You, you know, you go onto Lake Anna, and it's you can't even go there on a Saturday and think you're going to fish. I mean, mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen. You know, and this, it's such a densely populated area with so few fisheries and, you know, now with COVID and the onset of kayaking and just trying to get into even a small trolling motor only lake, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's really difficult to even find a place to fish, uh, to here. But, um, but yeah, you're, you know, I think being in an area where it is tough fishing, I think it, it can make you try things a little differently than you normally would. And when you can, you can take that experience in those patterns to a new lake and, and, uh, and try it other places. And, you know, yeah, you get bored after a while, not catching anything. So you try to, you know, well, I'll put a, I'll put a, you know, a, a, a worm on the back of my yeah. chatterbait instead of a, you know, this bait, or let me try this weird looking thing here. And you just try all kinds of crazy stuff to try to get a fish to bite. And you can, sometimes you luck into the right thing. No, it's that's yeah. I a hundred percent agree with that. Especially as we don't have a lot of big lakes. We have an insane amount of tiny lakes that are yeah. like, you can't in a perfect world. Honestly, if I had the money, I would buy a pimped out electric boat for some of these lakes because especially like the Norfolk area is like, good God, there's so many little yeah. lakes. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what was a lake that really that you get to cut your teeth on that really just helps you just from a practice standpoint, maybe you never could fish a tournament on there, but it's a good place to just get your reps in. Um, I think, you know, hunting run, 
uh, we had talked about hunting run. Um, I, I'd fished there a lot just because before they ever opened it up, uh, a friend of mine, his parents lived on there. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, so he would send pictures all the time of him catching these monster bass and, you know, it wasn't open to the public then. Uh, you know, so I was like, ah, oh, one day I got to get on there. One day I got to get on there. And then he said, Hey, they're opening it up. I was like, really? So, uh, I started going there and it has a lot of, you know, it has some shallow grass. It has some, some deep water. It has a lot of points and a lot of little cuts and humps and it has a lot of brush piles. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of techniques and a lot of stuff that you can do in such a small area. So, you know, you can get out deep on a brush pile and, you know, throw a jig or throw a big worm or throw a deep dive and crankbait in these brush piles, or you can get up shallow and fish beds or, you know, lay downs or grass lines. Um, you know, area small, these small lakes that you can break down relatively quickly and have a lot of diverse ways to fish, I think are really beneficial because you can, you know, you can really, you know, work a spinner bait one yeah. day. The next day you can go throw a, a jerk bait. Next day you can, you know, throw a jig in 20 foot of water, you know, having the ability to do all the different types of patterns in one place, it, it you know, it's really key where, you know, if you just had a, a small little pond that had grass all the way around, it, it was just a big empty bowl like Florida is, you can't really learn a whole lot by fishing in a place like that. You know, you're f throwing in grass and four feet of water. There's nothing else you can really do. So, um, you know, like Briary Creek is another one where, you know, you can fish all that wood and it's got big fish in it. You know, you can, there's lots of different things you can do. You can fish road beds, you can fish standing timber, you can fish the bottom, you can fish the top. There's lots of different techniques that you can use there um, to dial into, you know, even getting better with your equipment, which is another thing is, you know, you got to have confidence in your equipment. You got to, you know, if you've never drop shot it before, or if you've That's never true. thrown a 6XD before, um, you know, and if it's a predominant pattern on a lake, you've just got to know how to do that. So, and it's being able to go to these lakes and be able to try all these different techniques and really zero in and, and dial them in. How long did it take you since, since you are new to the fishing world to get proficient, confident with forward facing sonar? Was that like one time incident or is it still like, there's so much information I'm still kind of learning with it. Um, when I first got it, um, of course I'm enamored by it. Like everybody is, uh, you know, you, you just, you, I spent so much time just staring at it not even fishing. Same. I was like, Oh, cool. Look at that. You can see the fish turn around and go this way or turn around yeah. and go this way. Uh, and then once I really started fishing with it, um, cause I think the first time I ever turned it on, I was at St. Lawrence river. Um, oh, actually. damn. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> so, what, That's why you like it up there. <laughs> yeah. But see, the thing is, I never use it up there. I never used it. I've never caught a single fish using it at St. Wow. Um, wow. But I had it on up there and I was like, okay, well, that's cool. Now let, let, now let me go catch some fish. So I just went to dragging, you know, those rock piles and rock ledges and stuff like that. So I never even really used it there. Uh, but then, you know, a couple of tournaments after that, and even the off season really is where I really started to do it after the Toyota. Cause I didn't get it until the end of, um, the end of the season last year. I think, like I said, St. Lawrence river last year for the Toyota mm -hmm. series was the first time I'd ever put it on my boat. So you played around here with it. it. Okay. Yeah. So during the off season, I would go to Longa, uh, or, you know, Lake Mooney and, um, you know, and, and really just play around with it. And it was really crappie fishing is really what really dialed me into. I know, right? So, yeah. I mean, if you can, you know, you, you see it crappie and, you know, that's really what dialed me into it, but you pick it up relatively quickly. You know, the, the hardest part for me was, you know, once you get it dialed in, of course, um, knowing that you have to change your settings throughout the day or different parts of the lake, but once you get dialed in, um, it's one of those humbling things where, I love it and I hate it at the same time. I relied on it 100% at um, Toyota Series Championship on Table Rock Lake, and it it destroyed me. It destroyed me. I, I completely blew that entire tournament because of forward-facing sonar. Um, it just wasn't working for me at all. I, I couldn't get anything to bite, and it's you know, and that's the frustrating part about it is. You know, I'll pull up to a tree in 20 foot of water and I can see fish everywhere on it. Spotted bass, largemouth, 
crappie, every, everything's just piled up on this tree. And I can pitch in there with everything I have, different line sizes, different weights, different lures, and they're following it. They're kind of nipping at it, but they won't hit it. So you're like, well, I can't go move and do something different. I mean, maybe they're just, maybe it's a bite window that, you know, I'm just waiting for them to just decide that they're going to bite. Um, Cause during practice, they were just crushing it everywhere I pulled up to. If I, there was a, if there was a tree top and 20 foot of water, I was catching a fish on it. Mm. I mean, it was a hundred, it was guaranteed. Uh, during the tournament, they just, they shut down. They wouldn't do it. So, I mean, it, it killed me, but um, yeah, I think uh, I'm confident with it now. If I need to use it, I still don't, like to use it um but you know it, it, the way it is today if you don't have it i mean you can it, it won't guarantee you a win but no, it will guarantee can't. you a loss so uh yeah i mean you really you you gotta have it of course there's places that you can go we didn't have any florida tournaments this year so yeah. we didn't go to florida at all you know those shallow grass areas uh you know where you don't even need to use it but uh, what it's is definitely it about tool. those kids that are so good with it and this is where i think it's interesting when you look at it mm -hmm. there's two parts of it it's either their ability to make the fish react to a presentation that you can see and their ability to to cycle through baits or it's their proficiency in taking the technology and fine-tuning the screen to make it clean it's 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 one of the two correct um i think i think the biggest thing is the confidence in it and mm. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these kids, uh, you know, these, you know, the rookies that are coming up and a lot of these young college anglers, they've never known anything different, but forward facing sonar, you know, they may have fished with their dad or whatever in the past, but when it comes to tournament time, you know, they've, that's all they, that, that's, that's their, it. that's the majority of their pattern. Yeah. And you know, in a tournament, and this this is something hard for me too, is to understand. It's like I only need to catch five fish; they just need to be five good ones. Agreed. So, you know, I still struggle with that. It's like, oh, I'm not catching them every ten minutes. I got to move. I got to try something different. You know, I, I need to be getting hit every ten minutes or five minutes. You know, I fish this grass flat for an hour. I only got one bite. Let me go somewhere else. But, um, you know, the I think these kids they they really as odd as this sounds, they have the patience which you don't normally get from these younger guys, but they have the patience to do that. And they can sit there on a, on a brush pile and just sit and wait and just watch that screen and just watch that screen and study that screen. And uh, to have the confidence to know that eventually a fish is going to move in there and they're going to have an opportunity to catch it. But uh, yeah, they're, they're good with it. They're 100%. And, um, and I, I think that, like I said, I think, the, the confidence that they know that it, it's going to work. I think they, they can continue to do that where, you know, you get a veteran angler or, or somebody like me that really, you know, I didn't use it till last year. Um, there's so many other things that I could do like, Oh, let me go try this. Let me go drag, drag Carolina rig off this point, or let me go to this drop off or let me get out to this ledge or let me go flip boat docks. Or there's so many other options and patterns that, you know, are running through my mind if mm -hmm. I'm not catching a fish every five minutes where, you know, these guys are like, this is what I'm doing all day. So, you know, if it, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't, but this is what I'm going to do. And they can really commit to it. And, um, and I, and I think, you know, with them being able to commit to it, having the confidence to do it, you know, they're, it's, it's showing off They're They're being rewarded for that. And, and, it, and I think we always try to outthink the room with this stuff and, if you compare and contrast, because it is basically sight fishing, you're just using a camera. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, so if you're a good sight fisherman, well, what are you doing? Well, you can drive down the bank, you can figure out which size you want. Okay, cool. So you can do that with scope. And then you have to be patient. You got to watch the fish behavior to see if this is one you can even catch her if she's on her bed. And then you have to switch techniques. That's scoping. And it's interesting, like, it's pretty much the same, even though it's different. But there are so many people that are bad at it. And I like how you said, like, they just, <laughs> yeah. it's the confidence thing there. They yeah. just don't have that confidence confidence, even though it's the same game, it's just got a different color skin on it. I mean, that's what it mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, as I was, as I was saying that, it really kind of dawned on me and I'm sort of like having an aha moment in my head where, you know, that probably is it. It's, you know, as an older angler that never grew up with it, um, said, I, 
I always feel like I have way more options than just live scope where, you know, a lot of these, you know, these younger guys, that's what they're going to do. Regardless, you could turn all your other stuff off. They're going to have that live scope on and, and they're going to catch fish and they're going to wreck them. So, um, I think narrowing down those options is maybe a good thing instead of, you know, your mind going a mile, a mile a minute, trying to decide what you should do. And, you know, having something like that, it's like, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to stick with it. And, and it works out for them. Uh, and I agree with that, that what you just said there about narrowing your options. Cause you look at a lot of these Japanese anglers where they're like, well, I'm just going to fish this Creek and figure it out. Or John Cox saying, I just won't put scope on my boat. I'm throwing a wacky worm from here to Canada <laughs> right. in a foot of water, in yeah. a foot of water. And he will cash a check everywhere because it's just, you're simplifying your brain and what you have to think about. And I think there's a beauty in that simplicity that a For lot sure. of us as anglers, we just want to complicate it way too damn much. Yes. And that's, that's with everything, you know, that's with, you know, every lure manufacturer out there has a, has a beaver style bait, a flipping yep. bait, you know, and then you see one guy catch one on a Yamamoto bait or, or a missile bait or, you know, Guggen bait or whatever. And it's like, Oh, I gotta have that. I gotta have that. I gotta have that. And you end up with a, a tote of 300 pounds of soft plastics that are all basically the exact same thing. Um, you know, if you're, if you're flipping a, a bug beaver style bait in grass at Okeechobee, you know, and you're punching it through a mat, those fish are going to see it for a, a quarter of a second. They, mm -hmm. they could care less what color fleck you have in it or, or who, what brand it has, or, you know, does it have that one little tiny appendage on the side of it? I just, I don't think it matters. A lot of that stuff is to catch fishermen. And that's really something that I've, I've focused on this year is really narrowing down. You know, I don't need... 15 different worms made by 15 different manufacturers to, to, to catch a fish. You know, I just, I stick with what I know and, and uh, you know, it, it makes it so much easier to not to have to worry about all the little, little tricks of stuff that you don't even need really. What is something, and I'd love to have you back on like in October, November, to kind of talk about your, your, your season in review, sure. but, but right now, like what is something, you know, year one on the tour, like, you really think like, okay, this is something in the off season or when I have time, I would like to improve on to make myself a better angler. Uh, 100% it's fishing deep. Um, you know, a lot of these, you know, the, the Highland Reservoir lakes, your Dale hollows, your table rocks, um, you know, to get confidence in that, to, to sit over, you know, 80 foot of water over a school of fish, you know, um, and, and chase those fish down over deep water. That's, that's, that's a real big thing that I, that I struggle with just cause we don't have a lot of places to do that in Virginia. I know. Yeah. Um, and that's, like I said, uh, Lake Mooney is, is one of those places that I I've started to spend a little bit more time at because, you know, they had introduced those thread fin shad and those bass are really pulling off those banks and, uh, they're following those shad around those big schools of shad. And it's, it's a place that you can sort of mimic a Highland reservoir at. Uh, with the deep water, you know, the, the bait balls and, you know, the, the bass following them. So I think that's, uh, you know, that's something that I really need to work on, uh, scoping the confidence to scope, uh, you know, like I said, you only need to catch five fish and you get so hung up sometimes like, ah, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm not catching them every other cast, you know, there, there must not be fish here. And, you know, but you see a lot of these guys that really do well in tournaments and, they're not running and gunning to 500 different spots. They, they pull into an area that they know is going to hold fish. They're confident the fish are going to move in there eventually into a bite window mm -hmm. and uh, they'll stick it out. And uh, those are the guys that really do well. No, hundred percent. Kurt, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I know you're an absolute busy man. Is there anyone that we can give a shout out to or anything that we can plug? Uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, friends and family are really the big thing for me. The, as far as supporters, you know, like I said, being so new to this, you know, nobody knows who I am, uh, you know, as far as sponsorship and, you know, I, I've reached out to several different companies and, you know, they're just like, well, you know, you don't really have much of a presence yet, you know, and, you know, try next year and try next year. And, you know, this is, re it's really something where you have to have a support system behind you to continue to do it. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough where, you know, I have my own business and I'm able to, you know, take the time away to do it. But, you know, financially, it's a it's a struggle. And uh, if you don't have that support system behind you to really work, 
uh, and help you out with it. You know, it just, it, it won't, it won't last for very long. You're going to, you're going to really struggle and put yourself in a bad situation. But, you know, fortunately I have some friends that, uh, that covered a couple of my tournaments, you know, my dad shout out, big shout out to my dad. He covered a tournament for me this year. Uh, you know, striker, uh, I've, I've been with Stryker for two years now. Their apparel is, is absolutely phenomenal and it's, you know, keeps me dry and warm on the water. They've got cold weather gear, warm weather gear, rain gear. Uh, so Stryker is a big one, a big, a big one for me that, that keeps me comfortable on the water, you know, and then, uh, you know, the lure manufacturers that, that help me out, you know, Honey Badger Lures, 911 Custom Lures, Wu Tungsten, uh, you know, companies like that, 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 you know, that, provide me discounts on these, on the, on the equipment that I use. So that's, it's very helpful for sure. Kurt, again, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Uh, you know, please go check us out on social media. Also, if you'd like to try to become a Patreon member, we're only 10 Patreon subscribers away from our next major goal. If it wasn't for you guys, we couldn't keep the lights on. Like and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.